touch your face, Chuck. Good <laughs> evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am Josh Hayes. Welcome to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. I am joined by Chuck Touch Your Face Manly and Walt the Google Foo is strong with you, Robillard. And tonight we are talking about the Expanse books and uh, what is it? Amazon Prime now? Because um, who can't? Who shit canned it? Netflix. Netflix. Sci-fi. Sci-fi. Oh, yeah, sci-fi that's canned. right. That's right. Bastards. Um, so uh, before we get into kind of what we've been up to today, and and then before we get on our topic, um, yeah, yeah. So it looks a little different this week. Yes, uh, Rick Partlow very astutely um, says it's Streamyard now. Yes, you're right. Ha! Ah, look at that. And now we have text on the screen. Um, funny story about today. <laughs> I spent well. It's been all weekend. Uh, I've spent all weekend trying to. Oh, check this out. Watch this. Trying to um, make this work, and um, <laughs> all day I've been wiring my setup. I've got a new camera. I've got a new, um, obviously, a new setup here. My desk is or my office is completely re- remodeled. It's been all weekend on that. And uh, got Walt and Chuck on the line earlier today and um, troubleshooted for like, what do you think, 45 minutes. My computer crashed, shut down, like didn't want to do anything. And va, bada bing, bada boom, we go, why don't we just do StreamYard? That'll, that'll work or StreamYard. Um, so this is probably what we're going to use for the near future. Um because it's very intuitive and it's simple and uh, hopefully it'll do uh, HD here in the future. I don't know my, I'm remotely controlling my computer from my iPad here. Um, so I can't see the clarity, but it should be at least 720 on, on the broadcast side. Um, I, the reason I was trying to get it to, to run the other way is I've got a 4k camera now that should broadcast in 4k and it doesn't. <laughs> 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 because reasons so uh anybody uh anyway welcome everyone to the live show and to the new setup uh, everybody in the live chat welcome and if you're listening on the audio feed just know every monday night 8 p.m we do a live broadcast on youtube and um it's it's a really good time the cool thing about uh stream is now we can uh, bring comments over like in B Live, um, but this system is not as restrictive as B Live is, um, and it gives us a little bit more uh, flexibility in doing things. Um, and uh, if you have, if you are watching or watching later after, uh, and you have not subscribed to the channel, please do so. We're almost at 700 subscriptions. Um, and once you subscribe, hit that little bell, and then you'll get notified when we go live, or you should get notified we go live um so let's talk about what we've been up to this week before we get into our topic uh chuck what you been doing man well no i'm yes. sorry and touch your uh, face the whole <laughs> time. Uh, about the same old same old man i've uh i'm plugging away on uh the first book in a new urban fantasy series for athon and i'm doing a short story for a uh like a movie monster sh- anthology that kevin j anderson's putting together i'm going to submit that uh, next month sometime and here and there i'm working on the second book in the pikmin Files series and the third book in the brace cordova series so and then of course you know family and all that other stuff yeah all the, the what about you Walt? what's up man oh so much and not enough time to slam it with so uh, working a short story for The After, which is um, a role-playing game created by uh, John Gibbons uh, under um, Fainting Goat Games. They're doing a story anthology, so I've uh, been uh, working that. Um, secret projects abound, but beyond that, um, also slamming down some audio for um, Mr. Tim Taylor, uh, for narration for his uh, Human Empire book. So uh, trying to get those chapters out and as fast as possible. Um, every once in a while you get a little squeaky with a cold or something like that. You got to stop. But other than that, um, it's all Kung Fu for me, Josh, what's good. Oh man. What have, well, I just kind of went through what I've been doing, but, uh, writing, I am about 
75,000 words into Valor 2. And um, you're not writing fast enough. I know. Trust me, I've got a deadline on the 31st. <laughs> if Steve and Rhett are watching, I will make the deadline. Ish. <laughs> very ish. Uh, it's very ish. Um, I've, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm just now over the the um, the hump to the final act, and um, it should be kind of all downhill from here. So, um, it's uh, I'm writing the last confrontation, last uh, long battle scene. Um, which should wrap up the the book and 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 wrap book two up and then set us up for book three, the final book. Um, so I've been working on that. I actually stayed up really late last night working on it. I'll stay up again tonight working on it. Um, you know, you'd think uh, after going full time that I'd like smash out all these words, and it's just like I was riding high, like, and then. <laughs> Does it sound like a free fall or like incoming artillery? Um, both. <laughs> um, well, and the thing is that my worst part in writing is the end. Um, that's like I get to the end of anything and I just slow down and I find all these different things to do and nothing makes sense. And uh, uh, it's just... Uh, I hate writing endings, but anyway. Uh, oh, and I have to write an, a story for the after as well. Uh, um, so I'll be working on that probably next week to get that done. But uh, that's all I've been up to. Um, remodeled the office, got some lighting up, got some new bookcases. Um, we got this, it's kind of a bookcase slash um, standing desk and uh, built it all myself. Took me about five days but uh, it, it's given me a lot more surface area to work with. So now is that um, is that something you're going to stain, or are you just going to leave it as natural wood? Uh, I'm probably going to do like a clear epoxy or a clear uh, resin coating. Um, but I like the the kind of um, pale wood, uh, the soft wood look. I don't really like like the dark stain woods. I don't. Uh, my office is dark enough, so anything that kind of uh reflects light in a big big way then i uh, i try to do that more than more than anything now what we really want to know is we've seen some pictures of you remodeling the office when are you going to put the studio light where it's like on air on the outside of the <laughs> on the there outside of the studio uh i actually that's that's what like my my one of my my biggest I want to buy items <laughs> <laughs> is to get uh, a sign like that and put it out uh, on my door. The crazy thing is, is no one would see it because when I do the show, um, like my wife's already in bed, the kids are in bed. So I'm going to go and turn the light on just for me. And then everybody else that's watching, like I'll take a picture of it be like, see on the air guys. Don't well, what you could me. do is you could do like the old Letterman thing where a camera follows him out of the dressing room, right? So that, that you know, you leave the bathroom trying to hike up everything back oh, up right, and dodging right, right. children on the way down to the basement. You turn the light on and look at them and they scatter. Yes. That would be amazing. Or I could hide it, uh, hang it behind me on the wall and just yes. like, click it on. And that way everybody knows we're live because I click the, uh, the live button. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> I do want one though. I've wanted one forever. I've got a little on my door. Uh, Chuck was making fun of it earlier. I, I laugh at it all the time because I I wanted a uh, like a an an office like sign, and I couldn't think of anything, so I just printed out our logo on like regular printer paper and like <laughs> like like uh, scotch taped it to the door. I'm like that's official. <laughs> this is the official headquarters of Keystroke Media. So. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so this week we're going to talk about the expanse, uh, and it should be said there is spoiler alert, um, as we, uh, are, are going to go through this discussion on my part, I have read through book four. Uh, I actually downloaded book five last night and, um, started reading the, the first chapter in book five and I've seen, I'm current on the show and I, and the, the show is between season three and four and the show has pretty much followed the books. I mean, there's been some, some, 
things that they took out of the books and some things that they sped up for the series, but um, it's 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 pretty close, I think. I think look, book, books two and three pretty much take up season three, and then season four will start where book four starts. So the, this this series is three seasons, but it's 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 covered books one through four. I think is that right? Well, right. you also have um, they've switched some things around because uh, in Leviathan Wakes, um, you don't meet Avicerella, um in the beginning. She doesn't she doesn't show uh, up till a little bit later. Right, right. You know, so it's like some of the things they switched around to make the show more interesting. Yep. Um, the thing that I miss in the show that that is in the books is that Christian Av- Avicerella uh, has the filthiest mouth of any politician I've ever heard. And it's just, it's awesome. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when I have to take, I'm a, I'm a career soldier. And when I have to take notes from a book, either somebody did their homework or I'm just like, wow, this is brilliant stuff. I got to use this. Um, we're going to get into kind of breaking down the books a little bit. Um, as we talk about this discussion, actually, Rick Partlow has a really good uh, statement of uh, book one is not as good as book two which I agree with. Um, I, it took me twice, uh, maybe three times to get once, twice, three times. Uh, anyway, to get through book one. Um, but I think mostly the, the problem that I had with, with book one is the, the whole vomit zombie thing. Um, I, we talked about it a little bit last week, but the, the vomit zombie, that it, it and it's probably not as prevalent as I originally thought it was, but when I, I was listening to it on Audible while I was mowing the grass, and I remember this specifically, it got to this point, and like every five words seemed like it was vomit zombie. And I was just like, this was great. It was like kind of a really good mix between hard sci-fi and like really good character development, and like they weren't doing anything crazy. And then they started talking about vomit zombies. And I'm like, what? how did we get here? So it was, a sh- it, okay. Just so you know, I have read none of the books, but I'm current on the TV show. Okay. So in the book, was it just that sudden shift into that creepy zombie type thing? Did it, did you find that jarring from the more, character centered sci-fi or what did they just repeat the word vomit zombie over and over again? Um, kind of a little bit of a, uh, of both, I think, because um, you have in the books, it, in, in the first book, anyway, in the first book, it is Holden and uh, what the hell is his name? What's the cop's name? Oh, um, ah, um, Muller, Miller, Miller. Miller. So you have Holden and you have Miller. And those are the only two POVs that you have throughout the entire book. And they, they flip flop back and forth. And with Miller, uh, thanks Jay. Um, with, with Miller, um, you have a, a kind of a police procedural procedural aspect of the book. And with Holden, you have more of a kind of a space opera E type, um, scenario. So you, you're bouncing back and forth between those um, POVs, and then they come together. Um, and when they come together uh, and they start kind of doing this, like you said, kind of a zombie, um, uh, creepy type of thing, it just threw me off. And and they they probably didn't say vomit zombie a whole bunch, um, but it just seemed like they did. And the just it was more the term just kind of I was like, you couldn't come up with something better to call these things than now were, were they was that was that something that one of the characters that they were kind of like, I don't know what else to call them, so I'm calling them vomit zombies. Yes. Or was it yeah. okay? But then it but so a character said it, but then they just carried it on they through just the narrative. stuck with it. Yeah. Um, right. but that being said. I got through the first book and then got and read the second book. I liked the second book a, a whole lot. But then when the TV show came back out, I, I reread it. I re-listened to the thing and it didn't bother me a whole bunch the second time. I don't know why it, it messed with my head the first time so much. And the second time I knew it was coming. So when it, the first time it happened, I was like, oh, uh, whatever. And just kept listening. Um, but like Rick said, I thought the, the second book was phenomenal. Uh, just Just really, really, really good. Way better than the first one. Um, I thought they did a really good job with Bobby, and that that is your favorite character, isn't it, Walter? The whole sh- uh, shebang. Oh my God, I love Bobby Draper. 
just because she's she's just a typical marine stuck into a suit of power armor. Oh, it's so cool. Um, one of the things that I thought was really cool, and Rick actually mentioned it here too, is the um, the great thing about Miller and Holden's POVs was that they were they both think that they're one hundred percent right, and neither one is. Um, and I thought that was really really cool that you watch Holden and Holden is a very kind of uh, righteous person and he does all these things and people are telling him not to do it. And he's like, no, it's the right thing. Um, and obviously it backfires on him a whole bunch. Um, no and, good thing goes unpunished. Yeah, exactly. Um, and what's, I thought Miller was a, a, a really good uh, counter to that because Miller, who's supposed to be, um, kind of the champion for justice because he's the like, law. yeah he's the law he really is not he's kind of shady well, and not even a little bit <laughs> <laughs> um what i liked about bobby is she was kind of in between um she was very um loyal and um wanted to do the right thing but also knew that there was times where she needed to do something different that's why i liked bobby a lot uh, so, what you, Chuck, in the in the show, what was who's your favorite character for the show? Well, are all the characters in the show in the books, or did they add or subtract anyone? I, I'm talking them like the crew of the Rocinante. I mean, the the main dudes. Yep, they're all. I don't think they left anybody out. I don't think so either. I've read up to. I've read through the third book, and mostly everybody in the from beginning to end seems to be in there so far. Yeah. You ask me who my favorite characters are, and, and three immediately popped to the front of my mind. First is uh, uh, Miller, just because I love that he's, you know, he's supposed to be the law, but at the same time, he, he's so beat down by the reality of trying to be a good guy in this, not in this very, very, very gray world that, you know, but, but I like, I liked it that he, he latched onto this one girl, you know, if I can just find this girl, there's almost like he's looking for redemption from his past breaking the laws that he's done. Right. If he can just find this one girl, you know, you see what I'm saying? Yep. I, I just, I kind of like that, that he was sort of triggered that whole thing. I thought Thomas Jane did a great job of, of bringing that across in his performance. And I'm trying to remember the the guy's the character's name but he's the he's the no bullshit tough guy on the russell milo amos that, i know it's amos, amos. amos mm -hmm. i knew it was something like that amos he, i don't know he's just so simple and so straightforward right and, yeah like just so uncomplicated and i know that there was just there's something really cool about that i really like his character and i actually really like the pilot he's kind of a whiny guy sometimes but he's also He's just, he's really, he's dedicated, you know, it's like that crew, that ship, that's his, that's his people, you know, and I just, I don't know, but yeah, you asked me who my favorite character it is. Those three are the first three that pop in mind, but I really do like the, uh, the Marine chick too. Bobby. Um, I can't remember the names. Yeah. Bobby. She's just cause like you said, she's just, I, I've known quite a few Marines myself in my life and <laughs> they, she kind of reminds me a lot of them because they were just very straightforward and, you know, here's the mission, fucking go. <laughs> I mean, you know, it balls to the wall. So it was, yeah, I mean, it, it would it'd be some, one of those, probably Miller. If you, if you put a gun to my head, I'd probably have to say Miller. <laughs> Which he does very well. Uh, yes, yes. But I'm trying, um, to, I'm trying to think if there's any characters that I, I didn't like um, in the show or the books. Um, that I wasn't that you like, there are some characters that you're, you're supposed to not like. Right. Um, right. Uh, you know, I think the, there was, there was one thing that disappointed me about the first book and that was the, um, Julie Mao, um, arc, um, because you start with Julie. And so I, I kind of wanted to, build that character a little bit more like i wish there would have been a way to not kill her um because that she was so central to miller's thing but at the same time i get like yeah okay that's 
that kind of leads towards Miller's how he beat. Yeah, him. and and you know if you want the reader slash viewer to kind of get in Miller's head and feel what he's feeling, you had to make her really likable. Right. You know, this is that you could sort of feel some of the of the pain he felt looking for and knowing that you know that this is not going to end well. Right. Um, I, it it made sense for Miller. And it made sense for the story, you know, when, when he gets on the, uh, what's the asteroid called now? I can't remember, but when they're, uh, shooting it towards Venus, gosh, what's that? Is it serious? <laughs> Eros? Eros. Eros. Yeah, that was it. Um, and then he becomes whatever the communication psychic thing i don't know yeah now and i want to i want to kind of get back to to what you were saying before about the the vomit zombies and all that um again i haven't read the books but uh the one thing about the tv show i really did like um was you know i'm i'm the i'm the fantasy horror type guy so you know i like that stuff a lot but they did a super good job i thought of introducing the whole proto molecule thing and and the creepiness that was coming along with that and and setting that that very pensive kind of mood that you get when you're when you're facing something that's completely unknown you know like they they found julie and the crystals and things were growing out it was just horrible and then every time after that, it was just like every time they got into an encounter with the, the proto molecule critters or whatever they were, you know, you could just, they did a really good job of this whole, I don't know what the hell we're facing here and, <laughs> but we have to be here. And, you know, so I thought they really, for a, for a, what was pretty much a really good character and, you know, realistic sci fi type show, they did a very good job of introducing the the creepy elements without them actually seeming like supernatural or something you know it was just science they didn't understand and they didn't ever really try to make it you know mystical or whatever and, and i thought the i thought the show did a fantastic job with that that element of the story no i agree i think um the only thing that i really didn't like about the proto proto molecule um experimentation plot line was the um super evil doctor like the super evil like man oh the kidnap the kids guy uh well that and like there um well Mal, and julie's dad julie's yeah, dad, yeah. Julie's dad. chairman mal yeah yeah. Chairman. yeah 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 um like i, I whatever he's a ceo and he's in charge I, I was more kind of talking about the the scientists that are just like yeah messing with the kids but then like oh let's put this on a huge space station with a whole bunch of people and see what happens because we need more organic material like um that just kind of rang kind of hollow to me because i was like that is there really anybody that evil like, or, or that many people that evil? right right you know? exactly it was very cool. i mean if there was like five or six I might right. buy it. You know, right. you, could, you could get five, half a dozen crazy people in a room. I used to work psych. I know this, <laughs> but, but like there were like dozens and dozens of these guys. Yeah. And so you just got to wonder at some point, somebody would have had to call bullshit. Right. Yeah. You, know, you would think, um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad most of the people got what they deserved. Um, in the series, um, I felt I can't remember in the seer in the books, but there was a whole thing in the series where um, Holden is on the outs with everybody, and yeah. I can't remember whether or not that was such a big deal in the books or not. I don't remember in book three. I don't remember that arc being huge. That's prevalent. Was, yeah. Yeah, they really played it up in the show because they 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 needed that tension in the crew. Yeah. You know, they wanted that tension in the crew because in a book you can you can change point of views and and detail uh, a person's inner thoughts a lot more than you can on the show or on a show. So to have that kind of tension in between everybody, 
Um, it, I think it also, because of the, the way they, w they were shifting around certain storylines to kind of line them up with what they had going on in the show. Um, um, it was a good way. I apologize for any lapping noises. My giant hound is drinking water. Um, but um, with the way that things were kind of lining up in the show, um, it was good to show those shifting alliances because it, it highlighted the different communities that were all represented by the crew of the Rasanate. Yeah. You know, because you had somebody from everywhere on that crew. Right. You know, and, and it was, it, it just showed those different facets and who was out for who. And, and, uh, because I mean, you know, at one point everybody's working together because they're in survival mode. Then when they're kind of going on the offensive, suddenly this one's in interested in the proto molecule while this one has to get a message out while this one has to. And it all seems like they're, they're, showing that in the show so that you have that sense of the differing communities that even though this crew is working together for a common goal, they still have their loyalties to where they kind of right. move up. Right. Yeah. Um, that's another thing um, that I really liked about the series um, that kind of, I'm sure it's been done before, but the, when you think space opera and, and far future, you think multi-system and intergalactic yeah. and different planets and stuff. And I thought that they did a really good job uh, making the solar system big. Um, but then also like we have the Martians and we have the earth and we have the belters and we have, you know, all these different people making them, um, making their reasons for doing what they're doing plausible like marsh martians don't hate earth just because um and you know the belters are you know they have their own kind of dialect which i thought was really neat um kind of a different way to to handle something like that because how how would people kind of evolve and and deal with living in in well deep space for lack of a better word and and um, how would people, you know, growing up on Mars resent people on earth for, um, the things that they take for granted, right. but that was really, really well done. And I, I was kind of like suspect about it because, you know, when I picked up the book, I, I picked up the, the book, um, in paperback first, uh, on a Barnes and Noble, just based on the cover when it first came out, because I thought it was a nice cover. Um, and when I realized it was just in the solar system. And it was more of a hard sci-fi. I was like very concerned about, I could not concerned in how are they going to pull this off, but is it going to be okay? Like it seems kind of small, like, cause I'm used to these big overarching, like sweeping galactic civilizations. And I thought they pulled it off really, really well just in the solar system. Uh, I thought that was, that was really well done. Yeah, and well, even the, again, I think that comes back to the fact that it's so character driven. Yes. You know, there's so many, there's so many really well-developed characters for you to latch on to. It becomes more about their journey than about the, the genre tropes or whatever. No, 100% uh, agree. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I, I, and this is just me, I could be totally off base, but the way I saw the, the setting played out to me seemed a lot like, uh, colonized or, you know, the colonies, uh, North American colonies in Britain, you know, Earth being Britain mm. and Mars being uh, the North American colonies. And the belters are just kind of there making sure the ships sail the way they're supposed to and all this stuff. And <laughs> right. The, uh, the slave labor, basically. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, I just kind of thought it was, and, and I have no idea if that's the way the writers originally kind of envisioned it. That's just what it occurred to from my own perspective, but I thought that that was really kind of brilliant uh, inspiration wise for them to take a mechanic like that from history and then just blow it up to a bigger scale. And, and, you know, you've got the, the different culture, everybody's human, but you've got the different cultures, you've got the things and, and all the elements are there. And then, then they just throw in the proto molecule thing. And suddenly there's this whole new discovery that everybody wants, you know, and, and that's kind of like the resources from North America back in the colony days. When, you know, everybody suddenly realized how rich the land was and everybody wanted it. And so I just, I don't know. It's just, I thought it was a really good Testament to 
how you can truly find inspiration anywhere if you if you're willing to look and ask the right questions what i think is great is um uh and we'll do the show sponsor here in a minute but but what i thought was really great I mean, what they did in the the book series and because uh, they they kind of started off the like you said at the beginning walt with uh avasarla being in the first season when in the in the first book she wasn't a part of the, the book at all um and then in the in the second book is when you finally get avasarla and then bobby and then they become you know good main characters but what was interesting about uh the books is that you start off with a very small cast um on a on a grand scale but still a small cast you got the crew of the rosinante who are kind of thrown together by accident um which i thought was an interesting the way that the entire book flowed from the um the freighter the 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 attack on the freighter and then um them finding the martian ship or getting picked up by the martians and getting their ship and and the way that that all came together i thought was really really well done um i thought that um the way that the settings were kind of brought in piece by piece like with miller and going to these different places and and just creating the world and in that like it just like ballooned out and then when you get into the second book it gets a little bit bigger because then you get a little bit more of the politics that are going on and then the third and the fourth book just continue to kind of spread out and um uh, Bart says I'm really quiet. Um, I apologize. I'll I'll work on that. Um, but the the um, I liked how it it took um, the small scale, and you thought that you kind of knew what was happening, and then by the end of the third, yeah, by the end of the third book, it it the the ring starts being built, and it starts being the the proto proto, proto molecule starts doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then it opens up just a completely new, like when you talk about the expanse and it's in one solar system and you're like, that, I don't understand. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But then when you get to the fourth book and you're like, oh, oh, okay, uh, this makes sense now. And there's, you know, nine books in the series. And so you, you can just see kind of where the possibilities lie, which they're, they're endless um, because of what happened with the protomolecule at the end of book three. Um, I thought that was like the slow build of that. Um, I think in, a, a, a lesser author or authors um, might have tried to do that in one book, and and had that and and gone to the gates first um, because they wanted to do the cool like yeah let's get to the Stargate part because that's the cool part that everybody wants to see, and I think that you like Chuck you said earlier it's the characters and it's what right. we talked about a couple of weeks ago it's the characters that really pulled people in and so i thought that they did a really really good job of defining and building those characters to such a point where when the stargate deal does happen you're like oh that's really wicked cool but yeah. you're, you're more concerned about what happens to the characters after. right you're it's funny you say that because uh, when i watched the last episode of the of season three and the and the thing opened up and all that um, I kind of remember thinking to myself, I was like, holy crap, they just spent three seasons telling an origin story. Yes. You know, because that's kind of what it was. Because yeah. it's like when that happens, like, well, sh shit, there's the, that's, that's the whole new thing. I mean, you got, you know, all kinds of potential there. So, oh, yeah. yeah they sure. did a fantastic job with, with the character um, establishment and all that. Uh, let's touch on the, um, the, show a sponsor here real quick and i'm doing it on my phone because i don't have my computer in front of me and i don't want to screw up my uh, josh, josh, josh. i know um this week's sponsor is our anthology horizons beyond and um right now it is on sale for 99 cents you can go and pick it up uh, i'm going to try to put the link in the youtube through my phone we'll see if it works if it does not then you guys know what to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably didn't work. Um, I got you covered, Big Daddy. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know why that didn't work. Anyway, Horizons Beyond the Future is Now. Torn from the headlines of next year's news, Keystroke Medium brings you 10 stories, not from the distant past or centuries in the future, but close enough to change your life very soon. This anthology will take you on a journey you won't soon forget. 
with a forward by Matthew Mather, which is amazing. Um, it kicks off stories by Yudahanjaya, VJ Ratna, Patricia Gillum, K.R. McClellan, C.C. K.K., uh, Kayleen Williams, Andrew Gates, Walt Robillard, IQ Malcolm, Rick Partlow, and James S. Aaron. And it's, I mean, it's a really phenomenal uh, collection. I really, really enjoy it. Um, it's doing pretty good. Uh, if you have not picked it up, please go do so. Support the show and um, all the authors that have um, contributed the stories. The space opera, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Tom, of Doom. Space opera of Doom? Yes. Uh, space opera of Doom. Um <laughs> Uh, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> the space opera anthology is in edits right now with Lauren, and she's got some really good uh, stories she's going through on that. Um, and I think it's still we're on. I think we're still on part of publishing September, but we will see. And I've got the cover, uh, which I may or may not show. Maybe next week. We'll see. I like having secrets. <laughs> secrets and shadows. Yes. Um, so getting back to our discussion on, on the expanse, um, most of our discussion, I think is kind of centered around the beginning, uh, the first, uh, two, three books, the first two seasons or the first three seasons, rather, um, we're coming up, uh, December this year is going to start the fourth season on Amazon. And then, um, and I think the that. last book is scheduled for March of next year. There's going to be nine books in the series. Uh, there are somebody mentioned in a live chat earlier that there are several uh, prequel uh, nov novellas. Um, I, I I have not read the novellas, so I can't speak to their awesomeness, but I'm sure they are. Um, I know a couple of them center around Fred Johnson, the leader of the OPA, um, and I thought that was pretty neat too. That uh, um, you can have kind of a quasi terrorist organization and. Uh, um, the reasons behind that were, you know, they're not just because they want to cause mayhem and ruckus. Um, and they, they kind of, you can kind of sympathize with them a little bit. Um, and really when you look at, when you look at the series as a whole, um, there's protagonists and antagonists, but the only really the bad guys are like the mad scientists and wow. And wow. 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 <laughs> Don't forget uh, that Dick Wainwright. Yeah, oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah. Well, he, I, you know, he's, he's not really a, he's just an asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm getting a couple comments about. Know, my, uh, if you guys want to chat for a minute, I'm going to tweak my microphone just for a second. All right, we can do that. Oh, God, look, he gave us the keys to the king. Let's go in depth on the difference between dicks and assholes. <laughs> <laughs> if it's the care, it's the it's the politician guy, right? That's when that was when, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. He, he qualifies us both in my book. I mean, he, I was, so. he, was, a, he was a piece of work, man. So you're caught, you're all the way caught up in the show, Chuck. Yeah, I watched all three seasons. What did you think about the visuals? All of it, but <laughs> what did what did you think about the visuals? Like them actually, like all the sets and some of the three D CGI stuff. Um, uh, uh, the only time I ever really remember having a complaint was there was a few scenes with the proto zombies, and I thought they looked really stiff. You know, they were like running and jumping and doing stuff, but they, I don't know, they, they, they just looked, and maybe they were supposed to, maybe that was supposed to add to the, the inhumanity of them or whatever, but uh, that's really the only time, as far as the space stuff goes, I thought most of that was pretty, pretty cool, and then when the guy exploded because he hit the, the speed bump thing, that was kind of awesome. What do you think of the fight that the, uh, the Rasanate had uh, across that station with that other MCRN ship? Oh, that was cool. If it, yeah, if I'm thinking of the right thing, I thought that was pretty damn cool. Uh, well, it, it, but you know what? A lot of times in those space battles like that, when they've got all the guns blazing and all that, it's almost too much to take in, you know. And uh, and the Ross, the Rosinante being such a gunship, you know, if I'm if I'm remembering the scene you're talking about, I I mean, I, I never saw any problem with them, and and they were thrilling, as I'm sure they were supposed to be. I like the. Uh... Um, you know, I've seen, I've read some articles here and there 
about uh, pros and cons about how they're treating uh, certain things like, uh, you know, growing up in, in differing gravities, yeah. like some yeah. of the builders being extremely tall, brittle bones right. when they get to Earth. So they were closer uh, than that one guy. I'm sorry. They, I remember one scene where they had a they had the guy and they were torturing him. They had him in Earth normal gravity, chained up and stuff, and his limbs were all. I yeah. thought that was that would work if you. <laughs> like but also, um, uh, you know, you have uh, several times when uh, you know the ships had to change direction, alter course, or something like that, and everybody was told, "Hey, strap it down and and get in." You know, because then you had you had other things too, like uh, loose pieces of equipment pe hurting people, flying around and punching holes in the ship and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, craziness. There was a lot. Of, there was a lot of realism in that stuff. I did like the way the ships were like flip around, but what was that stuff they were supposed to be injecting? That's that something to stabilize your organs or something. I mean, I yes, never. Yes, you don't that. squish. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of like an internal flight suit. Yep. Um, it's kind of like um, the Navy that was uh, kind of messing around with liquid, ox uh, liquid uh, oxygenation systems talking about. back in the late 90s, early 2000s, so that your lungs and body wouldn't crush yeah, you just uh, at extreme like pressure. Like, like the abyss. Is yep. that any yeah. better now? Yeah, that's like right. louder. yeah, you seem good. Sound okay to me. Let me know in the live chat if, if you think, because I, I sound super loud in my headphones right now, so let me know in the live chat if I'm I sound good on my end, man. any better. <laughs> Silent Wolf just joined the thing and he says, I need to move my family dinner later so I can come make it to all the kids in lives. <laughs> and that's true. That's absolutely true. You need to cancel for being part of the community. Cancel all your family events when <laughs> it's uh, keystroke medium time. Yeah, I think I'm going to start uh, just bunking work every Monday. Yeah. Sound about the same. I don't know why. I don't, well, well, we can't muck with it too much. Um, I hear it fine in my monitor, so it's weird that the mix is all messed up. So I apologize. That's my fault. But your voice sounds lovely on our end. Yeah, mm. Your dulcet tones are lulling me to sleep. <laughs> uh, Lou Holson says, Monday is for your keystroke family. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so what do you guys, how do you guys feel about this originally starting as both um, an overlay for a, uh, a computer game and then later as uh, their homebrew setting for a role-playing game. I did not know that either of those things was a fact, um, but I, I absolutely approve of that. I understand that. I mean, my, uh, my Paragon trilogy was a setting I created for a role-playing game. I did a show on Writer's Journey with uh, Kayleen and, and uh, Lauren talking about the intersection of gaming and writing. I think, you know, if uh, I could absolutely see how that setting would work in a gaming environment. So I'm not at all surprised that it, it came out of that. I think that's brilliant. And they just relaunched, uh, they just licensed um, the, uh, the creative property to Green Ronin Publishing. Green Ronin, they, cool. Yep, yep. And they just released uh, uh, The Expanse. Uh, uh, Steve Kenson was a big part of it. So, I mean, there's they had a what, lot of like what, huge talent on this. What kind of system are they? It's the age system. So it's their like home system uh, that they originally used for uh, uh, another adapted property, uh, Dragon Age. They adapted Dragon Age into a tabletop role-playing game. Cool. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, yeah. The the, the art is is really, really neat. Uh, a lot of, lot of cool visuals in the book. So I picked it up just for the art. I yeah, mean, I'll have to look at that. That that sounds sounds interesting. I really wish I was bigger into tabletop gaming. Hey, you know what? Now you know how I felt when you guys were talking computer shit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you know, CPUs and threads and this and that, and I'm like, that's computer stuff, right? <laughs> I, you know, um, my buddy here in town um, loves board gaming, and he we've got a friend that basically supports like. Uh, probably like 20 kickstarters a year for games and he gets all these games he's got like just tons and tons of games and they have this game called spartacus i don't know if you guys have ever heard of it but it's a it's a basically an arena battle game with some strategy and stuff mixed in and um we always like are really psyched up to play I'm like yes let's play well then we don't start the game until like eight and it's like a four hour game and all good it, games are it god it's just like 
the last time we were playing, we got about through and, and the rounds are really long. Um, and so we got about, we got through like five rounds and I'm like, I gotta go. Like I'm tired. I gotta go to bed. <laughs> um, I remember when I was a kid, we, we do the all night gaming thing, you know, just let I me mean, like sundown to sun up and end of the day. And I, gosh, that I can't do that shit anymore. <laughs> I can't. If I told you the amount of times my mother came down and told us to everybody to leave the house, go wash your nasty asses. You jerks need Jesus. <laughs> we should. Yeah, I, guess, I guess you lived through the satanic panic too. Didn't yeah, you? a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> we should do a uh, like a monthly or a bi-monthly keystroke medium uh, online like D and D type game. Well, dude, I'll be honest with you, I. Uh, when we were talking after I did the show with Kayleen and Lauren, I was I got to thinking about it because I made the comment y'all should just come to Huntsville and we'd have a gaming weekend. But um, I started looking into these uh, tabletop virtual tabletop things. I think the one I looked at was called Roll Twenty. We're we're really tight into Roll Twenty. Uh, oh, Are yeah. podcast. We've interviewed um, the CEO as well as uh, some of the uh, design engineers. Uh, it's a fantastic easy to learn platform. Yeah. I was, gonna, I was going to look up some videos on, on how to get started on it and stuff, but I was thinking uh, that might be a cool aside for the KSM folks is like one Saturday, it, it would be a time commitment. It'd be yeah. a few hours, but um, if I get good with that, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to run a little something for you guys, whoever wanted in on it. Oh yeah. My table is six though. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't do <laughs> yeah. And if you, if you catch me uh, on the outside, uh, I can run you through all the particulars of roll 20 and have you up and, and running in no time. Cool, man. Yeah. I haven't downloaded or anything yet, but when I do, I'll definitely, uh, oh, it's I'll all web-based it nothing to download. Oh, well, there you go. See, uh, that's how ignorant I am. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious then on the, you mentioned that the expanse was supposed to be something like that. How, how would they roll? I mean, like I get how tabletop game works, but um, what wh what kind of game was it supposed to be? Uh, there was a game that came out in the early, late eighties, mid mid to late eighties, um, and it progressed through the nineties, and then it died off for a little while. Another game brought it back, and then the original rights holder uh, came back and released another version. It was, uh, but it's called Traveler. Traveler. And um, <laughs> the thing that's interesting about Traveler and that works really well with the Expanse is the character generation system. So it's almost a game in and of itself. And I know entire groups of people who play this game just to do the character generation system. Um, because what it does is uh, through random dice rolls, um, it just leads you through a series of charts. And then you make decisions based on those charts that lead you to you know the next stage. So each die roll actually affects a certain portion of your life. So like, um, rather than just saying, you know, I'm the loner with no name and no family. I have nothing interesting about me other than the fact that I kill everybody. Instead of that guy 15 times at your gaming table, you get some, <laughs> you get some people rolling some dice. Mm -hmm. And um, what you end up with is you get the guy who, um, and, and this was somebody's actual character that they rolled while, um, yes, Rick Partlow has the books. Wow. We're, we're going to have to do a KSM traveler game. <laughs> Rick's going to run. Um, but like what you can do is you roll those dice and you start off with a guy who was set for university. He, um, gets through his first two years of college and then gets busted for drugs. Does a couple years in prison, gets out, does some like low level hacker stuff that gets him involved with these pirates. He then gets saved from working for the pirates by the like the union uh police who then recruit him as an anti-hacker hacker and then he go and that's where his career picks up when you start the game that was somebody's character that they rolled which but, totally sounds like it would come out of the expanse right it's that is much, a character you could bump into much better than the guy going I'm going to throw my Serapi over my shoulder like Clint Eastwood back in the day because that's the only character I can play. I mean, it, it, it wasn't that. You know? <laughs> I mean, you, you get everything from nobles to businessmen to... Oh, to my God. To, I can't tell you how many players I had who... it didn't. They changed the name, maybe, class, whatever. But it was always the exact same personality every single yep. day. Yep. And, and that's what's so great about that particular game is the character generation system was so robust um, but the other side of the game that, that made it really 
really fun is even though um, Traveler itself had a kind of like an implied setting, um, uh, the Imperium, um, you could tailor it for everything. So like I've seen people use it to play Star Wars. Um, and I've also seen people use it to play like uh, Heinlein type stuff like Starship Troopers. So you can actually change the tech levels in the game so that like, you know, you could have an apocalypse world that where everything is is dust, but like you have these shreds of technology or you could have it all the way up to like, I use the force. You know, the thing about Traveler that's just a little scary is the combat system. It's not like Dungeons and Dragons where, you know, you, you, um, something hits your armor class and you're like, oh no, I've been hit. I lost 15 hit points. I have 30. I'm fine. You know, it's not like that. It's, oh my God, they pulled out guns. Everybody duck. Yep. You know, because the second weapons are introduced, the game becomes extremely deadly. You hit once and there's like wounds and complications and, and then your character's recovering. It becomes part of the role play. It's crazy. So I can absolutely see that. It strived for realism is what it did. Yeah. And now Rick is asking if I have any of the GURPS books. Man, I cut my teeth on on GURPS. You know, the ge uh, the general universal role playing system. Um, and, and that is another deadly, deadly system where you can do anything with the game. If you want to create the expanse, you want to create the expanse where, you know, you, you're running around in Thundar, the barbarian underpants. I mean, you can do whatever you want to do. Oh, I'm definitely doing that. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, once Except again, Josh Dar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! As long as I get to play the princess, it's fine. Um, but, yeah. Walt Waltina. <laughs> That's what my mother used to call me every time I stubbed my toe. I started crying. She's like, like a man. Waltina, uh, the mighty princess warrior. <laughs> oh my God! It writes itself. You know, but, um, yeah, GURPS is another deadly, deadly game. You know, the second dice hit the table where weapons are involved, because they have like bleed out charts in that game where you know you're how long it's going to take you to die based on the wound location. You know, so yeah. GURPS can be nasty, but yeah, there's a lot yeah, of games out there that can... Field. You can't shoot me because I've got a bullet force field. <laughs> <laughs> they call that plot armor. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> doesn't work so well in a role-playing game. Uh, let's bring this back to uh, the expanse here for the last uh, couple of minutes. Absolutely. And, um, what's that? He's just saying I left out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, the, let's talk about the, the, the strongest, what you thought was your favorite plot point of the, the, the books or the series that you have, um, seen or read so far. Um, I think mine, uh, mine was the, the, uh, proto molecule becoming what it was like it, it, it's purported to be this weapon and everybody thinks that it, this it's this bio weapon that the aliens are they're just trying to kill everybody and then it turns out that it's, that it's definitely not and it they're they're just trying to be helpful <laughs> and uh i thought that was a pretty cool um kind of a twist to the the whole uh, setup aspect of the the proto molecule um and then where it where it now leads humanity to. I thought that was a, a really neat way to get to that point instead of just having a, a, an advanced civilization show up and go, here's a gate um, or, or they <laughs> find it somewhere, you know, they, they find it in, they find it in Egypt under the pyramids. Hey, don't knock that it. Totally happen. <laughs> I think mine, if, thinking back on it, um, and I'm probably going to screw up some of the names here, so forgive me. But there was that one, maybe it was Eros, the space station, where the proto molecule just kind of took over. Mm. And then they tried to blow it up with a nuke on a ship. And Miller had to ride the thing down yep. into it. Yep. But the moment that got me was, I think it was just right at the end of the episode, when a proto version of him sort of goes hi, you know, here I am and starts talking to the, to the chick that he would, had been looking for that whole time. To me, that was really, really cool simply because it kind of upped the stakes a little bit. You know, it was a real turning point in the plot of the series because suddenly dead wasn't necessarily dead anymore. Mm. 
You know what I mean? Yep. It sure it sort of showed the storytelling going just just kind of up a notch in the in the realm of the fantastic. And I think that was really a uh, that that's the one that jumps out at me when I think about that question. And what about you, Walt? The thing I think I, I really enjoy most about both the books and the the series um, is the concept of clan. That no matter how far advanced we come, no matter how far we spread, we always have this tendency as human beings to associate with a certain group. And everybody outside that group is kind of on the outside because, you know, they want what we have or they can't be like us because they don't have our experience. You know, we can't just as a, as a species come together and say, you know, let's Star Trek this shit and just love each other and there's no money and let's go off into space and just hug everything. Right. right. You know, Again, we, realism. Yeah, yeah. We can't do that. We're too, we're, we're too um, uh, you know, tribal to do that. And I think that comes across well in the books in that even though, you know, it, on, on in the belt, you have Russians, you have Chinese, you have... Um, uh, American, British, right? But they're they don't. That's not them anymore. That's where right. they came from. Right. They're belters now, and right. and everybody outside the belt doesn't doesn't get us because they don't live here. They don't do what we do. I think that was cool. But the other the other theme that um, that really hits right around the end of book three, just how small we are. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you have all these big politicians, blah 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 blah, and then when they start realizing what's going on, it's like. What, what what do we do? Right, we're we're helpless. What, yeah. Like, what can we do? We throw nukes at it, nothing happens. You know, we we try politicking the crap out of it, nothing happens. What do we do? We're helpless. You know, and I think that that's really interesting, because I mean, at some point in reality, humankind is going to have to come together and say and say, you know, we're really small. We might want to just right. You know, I mean, it'll never happen because of the whole tribal thing a minute ago. Right, but. I'm going to say that because I've heard more than a couple of astronauts and in like interviews and stuff talking about how looking at Earth from space kind of puts it all in perspective. You know, that just how we're just this tiny little blue dot in this just infinite ocean of black. And you kind of go, eh, maybe we're not as important as we think we are <laughs> you know the other side of that though is uh, and uh, i gotta credit jr hanley for finding this is that um uh, the other day um we had our first um terran slash orbital crime committed <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. i it's, was talking to my wife about that this morning and, and it's like you you're hovering above the earth you know and it just goes to show you how something so amazing once you see it enough can become so mundane you know uh, right. a really really good friend of mine who was a soldier and seen a lot a lot of terrible things um said to the doctor in the waiting room when his baby was born he's like wow it must be amazing to see life coming into the world every day instead of like my job where i take it and the doctor was like yeah it's okay because <laughs> he sees this on a day-to-day -day basis, so yeah. to him, it's not amazing, right? And I think that that's might have what happened up up top. You know, you've seen this blue marble so many times. Now I'm going to focus on that ex who really screwed me. I'll show her a thing or two. Yeah, you know, that's a good. Point. And it's interesting. Well, I made the joke with my wife that you know it's like humanity's awesome. We're 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 taking our awfulness to the stars. It's just. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting because you, you mentioned um, like how small we are and then everybody realizes how small they are at the end of the book. And then um, all these different events happen where um, everybody just you can't control. It's out. The, it's outside their hands. And then when you get to the fourth book and um, it starts, it basically starts all over again because you have these people on this planet that weren't supposed to be there, but now they're there and it's them versus the people that were supposed to be there. And the people back on earth are too far. Like, so it like, it's a vicious cycle and, but it's, but it's a true vicious cycle. Like it happens everywhere. It happens. Yeah. More know. humans being human. Exactly. I mean, that's I, what I, it boils down to. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm really interested to finish the series um and and see where it goes i i know we're there there are uh, eight books out right now uh, and like i said earlier then the ninth 
and purportedly the final book in the series is coming out in March of next year. Um, hopefully they carry this, the TV show on through that. Um, it'll be interesting to see who finishes first the TV show or the, well, I guess if they, if, if the books come out next year, that the books, the books will be done. Yeah. I don't think it'll be a George R. R. Martin situation. Right. Yeah. Especially when, you know, James S. A. Corey is actually two guys. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and they're kind of combining. Um, I wonder if they're going to continue to combine books and series, but I am interested to finish it because I'm really interested to see where it goes. And um, and maybe we can come back and after we've all either a read the all the rest of the books or or the watch the series, come back and do a a follow up episode to this and and talk about how the series ends and thoughts on it and stuff. I I thought that'd be really cool. Hell yeah. Wood. Um, well, everybody in the live chat, thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us tonight. Uh, as always, it's been fun. And uh, hopefully this is the final iteration of uh, the version of podcasting <laughs> that we're doing. Um, I, yeah. Oh, now you've done it. You jinxed yourself. Ding. You did. I thought this worked out pretty well, though. No, it did. And uh, we didn't have any of the issues that we were having with Jitsi or Skype or anything else. I, that I thought that. We didn't have a max headroom again, which I was. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like it was like watching Mars attacks all over again. Like, uh, and I apologize if my volume's uh, still quiet compared to everybody else. I apologize. Um, I'm cranking the volume on my soundboard, and even right now, I'm going to turn it up just a little bit and see. I don't know if that even adjusted on that end. I just cranked it, and in my ears, I'm like yelling in the microphone. So it's very strange. Anyway, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. <laughs> I blame it on Walt. I blame it on Princess Waltina of Death. <laughs> yes! <laughs> oh, I can't wait for this game. It'll be amazing. <laughs> uh, so coming up, uh, I asked uh, I asked in the uh, Facebook group, Keystroke Medium slash, uh, well, actually, it's Facebook.com slash Keystroke Medium um, is our public group. I asked in that group the other day what your biggest pet peeves are in uh, writing and uh specifically in genres and, and what people get wrong and do differently in those genres that you don't like. Um, I'm going to try to start a series on those questions and answers and then um, talk to the people that ask the questions and see if they have um, ideas on how to fix those particular pet peeves that they have. Um, Kayleen uh, started a series this morning about... Um, it's basically the first chapters of books that she's going to read. Um, she read Scott Moon's book this morning, and I thought she did a fantastic job. Uh, if you didn't catch it on the Facebook feed, uh, go and, and search for it. It's in the group. Um, I think we're going to try to get it on the, the YouTube channel shortly, uh, but right now it's only on Facebook. But you should go check it out because it's really neat. Um, and then I'm probably going to start a, uh, a segment um, probably in the next couple of weeks um, where I read the first chapter not on air but i read the first chapter of a book and then do like a five to ten minute um whether i liked the chapter or didn't like the chapter or whether i thought i would continue to read the book after um reading the first chapter um just to kind of get some more content out and, and do some different fun things so uh everybody that come and hang out with us tonight thank you guys for um i coming and hanging out and lou asks when's the morning haze coming back i don't know um Hopefully, um, when my schedule slows down after I get Valor 2 in off my deadline, I'll be able to spread out my writing. I When I first went full-time, I did the morning haze, and I had a huge number daily word count that I was trying to hit, um, and it was just too much. I couldn't do the word counts and get the morning haze done, um, but now my word count requirements have diminished somewhat, and uh, so maybe I'll be able to bring that back once or twice a week because it was fun. I liked it. I thought it was a, a good time. And uh, I think everybody else on a Monday morning or Wednesday morning has fun doing that, too. So maybe we'll be able to bring that back. Uh, I have no idea what we're doing next week because I don't have my calendar in front of me and my computer's way over there. Um, but you definitely should come back and hang out with us. Um, Lauren and Kayleen show will be on Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. And be sure you hang out with those guys. Um, so thank Next you guys. Monday is Labor Day. Are we doing a show? Hmm? Next Monday is Labor Day. Mm. So, and then after that, we've got Andy 
Peliquin. Peliquin. We shall see about next Monday. All right. We shall see. Um, anyway, so thanks, guys, for putting up with us for an hour and uh, hanging out with us while we talk about the expanse. Um, we've got some other roundtables coming up. Um, maybe we'll put a poll in a group and see what we want to talk about. Gosh, I don't want to talk about Dune. Oh, that's huge. Yeah, I have to oh, that hurt. memory. It's been a while. That was like the number one response in the poll I put up. Oh, God. <laughs> so they like pain. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you, they, so I, uh, before we go, um, I read the first book, and it took me like two or three times to get through it. The, the, the one thing that sticks in my head over the entire book is when um, Paul and his mom have like crash landed and they're in the desert or something. And they're like staying in this tent and the tent, I guess the opening <laughs> he describes as like an opening sphincter and it like sphincters open, like, and it like threw me. I was like, what the hell is he talking <laughs> about? I was like, like I couldn't picture anything, but like, yeah. So that's, that's my whole take on, on Dune as a sphincter tent. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys are welcome for that. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Don't forget those still suits too, the way uh, those work. Yeah, exactly. Uh well, thanks everybody for hanging out with us tonight. If you're listening on the audio feed, make sure you come and hang out with us on Mondays. If you haven't subscribed, do so please on our YouTube channel and on our um all of our uh audio feeds. Thank you guys very much for your support. We will come back next time and talk about some reading and writing and everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. Peace. Later, guys. Ciao. Ciao. Okay.